Good afternoon and welcome to LLT 121. Uh, my name is Dr. Pauline Nugent. I'm a member of the uh, Classics Department uh, and I will be offering a lecture today on the goddess Venus or Aphrodite who is the goddess of love and marriage. And first of all, I will give you some notes on the history. We will talk about the origin of this particular goddess who has an influence in all aspects of human life, quite obviously. She is mostly associated with the East. She's got a sort of an oriental aspect to her. She seems to be identified also with such gods as Inanna, and Inanna is the old Sumerian goddess of love, beauty, so forth. Or you might call her a copy of Ishtar. Ishtar from the same part of the world would be one of the goddesses of the Babylonian um, period. And she's also associated with Astarte, or Ashtarte if you wish. Uh, who is variously associated with uh, Phoenicia or Anatolia, which is now, of course, Turkey, or Phoenicia, the area we today call Syria. She is likewise associated with the goddess Sibylle. And Sibylle is often referred to as the Magna Mater, the Great Mother, the mother of all the gods, also associated with the area of Turkey we used to call in antiquity Phrygia. And of course she is identified for all practical purposes with Venus, the goddess of love in Roman mythology. So we have the goddess Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty, being a sort of carbon copy or an import from the eastern over towards Turkey, the eastern part of the world, identified with various and sundry major fertility goddesses in that part of the world. And I, I, I point this out for your information because most of the stories that we have relating to Aphrodite take place away from Greece. So this may well explain why she is a uh, goddess of love and beauty, a universal goddess, but at the same time somehow foreign or extraneous to the land of Greece. We refer to her as the Cypris. Cypris or Cypris and a C and a K obviously in Greek are the same letter. Cypris. Uh, a variation of the name Cyprus, the island of Cyprus over in that part of the world, for the simple reason that when she was born, she floated over towards the direction of Cyprus. So we refer to her uh, by the um, epithet Cypris, or Cyprus, if you will. And she also is called Paphos. Paphos. And if you know a little bit about your geography, Paphos happens to be the capital of Cyprus in the olden times, one of the major cities. It isn't the capital today, but it is one of the major cities in Cyprus. So once again, we have situated her over in the east. Um, and um, the one exception is the story that connects Aphrodite with Ares, and we will talk about that as we go along. But with that apart, Aphrodite and Ares and their love affair, all the rest of the history that we associate with Aphrodite tends to be outside the province of Greece. Now I want to talk about some general information on this particular goddess. We'll call it just general info and uh, place a number of items under that topic. Love and beauty, generally speaking, is what we associate with Aphrodite. She is the personification, if you will, of the concept of human love, of sexual love, of beauty. And first of all, with regard to her birth, 
We have a number of stories about the birth of Aphrodite. One of them comes from the um, poet Hesiod. Hesiod, whose work, The Theogony, gives us most of what we know about the earliest thinking of the Greeks in terms of the birth of their gods, the creation of their world, and the creation of humankind. So we have Hesiod's Theogony telling us a little bit about the birth of Aphrodite. And this comes from uh, uh, lines 188 of the Theogony, where we find an account of the castration of Uranus, and you may well remember the name of that particular uh, god, one of the early sky gods, Uranus being, of course, the Greek word for sky. And in that story, Gaia had married Uranus, and Gaia, Mother Earth, got sick and tired of having the children to whom she gave birth stuffed back into Mother Earth by Uranus, their dad. So she just decides, well, we'll get rid of this once for all. And so she castrates her husband, Uranus. Or rather, she has her son, Cronus. Cronus castrate his dad, Uranus, and throw the severed members into the water. Now, from those severed members, we eventually find a young maiden arise. And around those severed genitals, we have a froth forming. And out of the foam or the froth that, sur that uh, surrounded these severed uh, members of Uranus, we have the birth of Aphrodite, a beautiful young maiden arise. Now, we have a Greek word, af, a, f, f, or O S Afros. Afros, which could be written in English A P H R O S. Afros is the Greek word for foam. And therefore, it's a very easy step to see. The name of the goddess is Aphrodite, she who arose from the foam on the genitals of Uranus. So that's one story about the birth of Aphrodite. There is another one, and the other one comes to us from Homer. So first we have Hesiod's story, and second we have Homer. And Homer tells us that she, Aphrodite, is the daughter of Zeus, and a lady, a nymph lady, called Dione. Dione. We don't have a lot of support in our major sources for this particular story, but still, it comes from Homer. And Homer is one of our major um, authors in terms of early Greek thinking. What is interesting in this particular aspect is that Dione, the very name of Dione, is really a part of Zeus, a feminine equivalent, if you will, of the name of Zeus, which in Greek becomes dios, dios for the genitive form. And then it's a little step to dione to make it a feminine form. So what do we have here? Well, it's very difficult to say. But the author seems to tell us she's certainly the daughter of Zeus and some variation of Zeus's name. So we have, in other words, a very real ambiguity about the birth of this particular goddess. We've got two stories on that particular form. And I want to read you just a tiny little part, which comes, first of all, from the Theogony, about Aphrodite when she is born. This is what the poet says. This is. Uh, directly from Hesiod's Theogony, about line 188, he says, As soon as he, that would have been Cronus, had cut off the genitals of his father, he threw them from land into the turbulent sea. They were carried across the sea for a long time, and white foam arose from the immortal flesh. 
Within it, a girl grew. First, she came to holy Kithara, and Kithara is a little island very close over there towards Cyprus. And therefore, Kithara gives us the other name, Kitharia. Kitharia, another name or epithet or descriptive adjective of Aphrodite. So she goes to Kitharia, and next she washed up on the shores of Cyprus, and therefore we call her Cyprus or Cyprus. Now, if you will listen very carefully, this is how she is described. An awesome and beautiful goddess. And grass grew beneath her supple feet. And then we are told that she is not alone, but she is accompanied by a rather lovely group of pleasant individuals. And this is what Hesiod says, Eros accompanies her. Eros, the god of love, accompanies her. And fair Himeros. Eros, a Greek word for love. Himeros, a Greek word for desire. So we could say in English that wherever you've got Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, you have a cute little Cupid personification of love, and you awaken desire in the person. When first she was born to meet the gods and went to meet the gods, Aphrodite is accompanied by both Eros and by Hemeros. Now this next little part is what I consider probably the most insightful information that Hesiod gives us. Listen to what he says. She has such honor from the first, and this is her province among mortals and immortals. And this is the description. Girls, whispers, and smiles, and deceptions. Sweet pleasure, and sexual love and tenderness. There you have it in two lines. You have smiles and deceptions. In other words, right from the very start, from our earliest sources of Greek mythology, there is a sense of ambivalence about this notion of love, of human love, of um, love as a gift which is irrepressible, and uh, desirable, but also at the same time a sort of negative sense to, to it as well. And that is why we've got the idea of love as um, giving rise to girls' whispers and smiles, but at the same time also their deceptions. I want to go back for just a moment, if I may, to an earlier version of Eros, or Eros, as I tend to call him in Greek. Eros, the god of love, has appeared on the scene earlier than Aphrodite. In other words, in this same work, the Theogony, but a little earlier on, say about line 120, we are told that um, the world is created. There's chaos. It just comes. And Hesiod doesn't bother to tell us how it gets there. He simply says, there it is. So we have chaos and we have Gaia, we have Mother Earth, chaos, we have Gaia, or Gaia, as you wish, or Mother Earth, and we have Tartaros, and we have Eros, and then we have Uranos, and we have things like Urea, and we have Ocean, Okeanos. Okeanos. In other words, all of these particular items, if you notice uh, very closely, are earth and sky and a hole in the earth, a black hole, Urea are mountains, and this is water. Ah, but Eros. In other words, at the beginning of creation, when there was chaos and then there was something else, that something else was a series of what I want to refer to as 
nature deities, nature. You have mountains, you have rivers or water, mountains, sky, and earth, and a black hole in the earth. And then you've got an oddity added, as if it were almost out of place. You've got Eros, and Eros is not really a nature deity, at least not in the sense that the others are. So if you were to ask me, what do we have in the beginning? After chaos, we have a series of nature deities, and then we have love. We have love. The concept of love was right there at the start. And this is the way Hesiod tells us about love. He describes love as Eros, most beautiful among the immortal gods. Limb weakener, who conquers the mind and sensible thought in the breasts of gods and humans. Now that's an interesting concept. Very, very different from the nature gods is love. It's a very different sense. It is identified as an immortal god, but an immortal god who weakens the limbs of people. In other words, your knees are knocking when you're uh, anxious about what you're going to say to your beloved. And love, eros, is seen as conquering the mind and sensible thought for gods and humans. In other words, if you are in love, are you falling in love? You've been in love? You're on your honeymoon? You just got married? Are you looking forward to it? Love can interfere with the sensibleness of your expressions. You will find yourself, in, for instance, saying things when you're in love that you wouldn't be caught dead saying in another situation. So right from the start, even before the birth of Aphrodite, we have the Greeks talking about love in a sort of ambiguous sense. It's attraction, it's irresistible attraction, if you will, but also this sense in which limbs are weakened, minds are obscured, thoughts are not so clear. So it's irresistible, but there is a kind of, um, oh, perhaps we could even say enslavement there. So the certain sense of ambiguity is set up in Greek thought right from the start. That's an interesting thing I'd like you to keep in mind. You can merely remember it if you want by talking about the smiles and deceits of young girls. Smiles and deceits. It's wonderful, but beware. There's that sense of cave canem, watch out, that is protruded, that is... Um, talked about when we talk about love in Greek. Now, when we come back to just general ideas on, um, on this particular goddess, we could mention that some of her symbols are rather interesting. One of the symbols that are usually associated with Venus or with Aphrodite in Greek are doves, love doves. We talk about that today even. The sparrow is sometimes associated. And the swans, that beautiful, graceful swan, is shown frequently in artworks as drawing her chariot. So those would be basically her symbols. She is seen as the wife of a gentleman called Hephaestus. And Hephaestus, this will be number two, Hephaestus, wife of you may remember that Hephaestus is one of the gods, but not particularly the cutest. He's the god who's a bit deformed, a bit defective. His mom or his dad threw him out of heaven, Zeus in some stories, and then of course in other stories he's the son only of, of um, Hera. So Hera got tired looking at him and wasn't too happy with him. So she threw him out of heaven, out of Olympus for a while. But here we are, Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty, married to Hephaestus. Another case, wouldn't you say, of maybe beauty and the beast. Opposites attract. 
something that we can say is still very much a part of human life today. She's not particularly faithful to Hephaestus. She has a number of other liaisons in her life, but officially she is the wife of the ugliest of the gods. There's one story about um, <coughs> the unfaithfulness of um, Aphrodite, and it's associated with the god Ares. Ares and Aphrodite are in love with one another. And you might say, well, that's a rather odd couple, isn't it? Well, not more odd than this one, for sure. There's a certain ambiguity about the beautiful wife and the ugliest of the gods. And there's a certain ambiguity here, or perhaps they're more compatible. But Ares, you remember, is the god of war. So you have war matching with love. And an aside here for a moment, uh, I might want to mention that uh, love and war in, particularly in Roman elegiac poets, um, are very similar, are very often con compared, contrasted, paralleled to one another. This event is given to us in Odyssey 8. Homer tells us the story, and it's a rather uh, laughable story, and it's done for the um, entertainment of the gods and the diffusion of tension. Hephaestus is away visiting some of his far-off friends. Ares creeps into uh, Aphrodite's bed, associates with um, Aphrodite in the absence of her husband. And uh, the sun, Helios, tells on them. Helios, the sun god who sees everything, tells Hephaestus, hey, watch out. Guess what's happening back home? So Hephaestus, instead of continuing on his journey, comes back home and he weaves these wonderful little invisible webs over his bed so that next, then he goes away, so that next time Ares and Aphrodite get together in Hephaestus' chamber, they are going to be caught. And that is exactly what happens. And they become the butt of the jokes of all the gods. And I might want to add here that the goddesses were much more discreet. They didn't bother to come and admire the couple caught in the act. So we have that particular little story coming to us from, uh, from Homer himself. Later literature talked to us about Aphrodite as being the mother of Cupid. Or Eros. I would suggest that you um, Try to keep this earlier Eros, the earlier one we talked about over here, I would try to keep him apart. He's a much earlier variation. Love, yes, but I tend not to equate him with the same character which appears in later literature. Cupid in Latin, but Eros, the Greek translation. So she is shown as the mother of Cupid, and she is also shown as the mother of a number of other characters as well. But this is the Eros, which we associate with, uh, say, for instance, Valentine's Day. This is the little boy, the little cherub, with his little bow and arrow that shoots uh, people and has them fall haplessly in love, rather than the first force, which is a more primeval or primitive force of nature. Um, moving along just a little bit farther, I want to look a second time at the sense of ambiguity. We've spoken about the two, the double story on the birth of, um, on the birth of Aphrodite. <coughs> Now, there's also another story on the uh, name of Aphrodite. She's got two titles. She's got the title of Urania, or if you prefer in English, Urania, Aphrodite, Urania, Aphrodite, Urania, the heavenly Aphrodite, given to her because of the 
Hesiodic story of her birth, her birth from the foam as given in Hesiod. And this title shows Aphrodite as a goddess of oh, pure love, perhaps we would want to say a higher, more philosophical type of love, a more elevated love, let's call it that, elevated love. And the second title she's got is uh, Pandemos. Pandemos. Pan is a Greek word meaning all, and demos is the word that gives us democracy, so it simply means all people. And under this guise, she is shown as the patron of normal, everyday family life, marriage, sexual love, and so forth. So this is the more earthy Aphrodite, whereas this, by its very name, is the more heavenly Aphrodite. Uranos, over here, remember, Uranos meant the god of the sky. So there are two different um, aspects which reflect through her title. One giving her a sense of patroness of elevated love, the love of philosophy or the love of the truth and the beautiful and the love that surpasses simple earthy love to get to something which is really the essence of love. And that would be Aphrodite, Urania or Urania, same word. And then you have the more earthy form, both very, um, both very real, more sensuous type for the, uh, Uran uh, for the Aphrodite Pandemus. Now I want to talk just a little bit about the stories or the myths crea um, created or associated with Aphrodite. Um, you might want to leave a little space in your notes under number three. If we have a little time at the end, we'll come back and do a few more items there. When we talk about the myths of Aphrodite, what we've got there are a number of uh, stories, one of which I've already given you, which is the story given in Homer, Odyssey 8. These are stories associated, myths or stories associated with stories of Aphrodite. There are a number. Your book will probably give you a lot of major detail, and I suggest you may want to uh, refer to those. This is part three in our outline now. Um, we've talked about Ares and Aphrodite, so we won't talk about that again. And your reference once more is Odyssey 8. We have the wonderful story of um, Anchises. Anchises. And we have another story about Paris, for instance, and another story about Pygmalion. Oh, we'll see if we can get through all those today. We'll just go that far. When we talk about Anchises, this is a very lovely story. Anchises is a shepherd, a wonderfully handsome shepherd, over in the Phrygian territory, over by Troy, over in what we call today uh, Turkey, northern, northwestern Turkey. And uh, so once again, remember I said, apart from Ares and Aphrodite, we're going to be abroad in most of our stories. We're going to be over in a, sort of an oriental setting for uh, Aphrodite. Um, um, Aphrodite falls in love with this shepherd. Um, she talks him into believing that she really isn't a goddess. She's just a, a very pretty girl, human being, but her father is so-and-so and her mother is so-and-so. And she is falling in love with him and they have an affair and the child born of that union is the famous Aeneas, who is the hero of Virgil's Aeneid. And Virgil's Aeneid is the story of Rome's founding and its greatness. And the main character is Aeneas, offspring of Anchises the shepherd, the Trojan, the Phrygian shepherd, and the goddess Aphrodite. In this story, we tend to say, and the goddess Venus. In other words, 
we call Aphrodite by her name, her Roman name, because now we're getting into Rome and Roman territory. So normally we refer to her here. She features quite frequently in the Aeneid, hovers over her beloved son Aeneas, uh, frustrates him insofar as she won't allow him to embrace her, to be with her and so forth, but she also protects him. So Venus and Anchises, parents to Aeneas, the hero of Rome, the founding uh, hero of what will become the city of Rome. The story of Paris. Paris is um, uh, again another shepherd and a very, very handsome shepherd at that. Paris is actually the son of the king and queen of Troy. And uh, there was a prophecy about Paris that he would really destroy, um, destroy Troy when he grew up. And so when he was a baby, he was sort of put out on the mountains to die, to be destroyed. But nevertheless, as with all promising and famous people, they have rough beginnings, but he survived. And he's a very handsome young man. Now, it happens that Paris is out in the fields taking care of the sheep. And uh, there's a big wedding going on. And the wedding is the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. Talk about the marriage of the century. This was it. Peleus and Thetis are getting married, and Zeus is throwing a party for everybody. Oh, well, not quite. Almost everybody is invited. There is one lady, Eris, and she doesn't get an invitation. But guess what? She crashes the party anyway. Eris, you see, translates as strife. Not exactly the type you want to attend your wedding party. So she comes anyway, and she brings a gift. And the gift she brings is a golden apple with the inscription for the fairest. She throws it in on the wedding floor, on the, and uh, Zeus has a problem in his hand. He thinks, oops, how am I going to decide between my wife, Hera, and my beloved daughter, Aphrodite, and my most beloved daughter, Athena, my firstborn daughter, Athena. So he has a major problem. And he thinks, oh, I know how to wiggle out of this one. He calls the messenger of the gods, whose name is, of course, Hermes. And he says, Hermes, take these three ladies over to the mountains of Troy, where Paris is. And if he is the prettiest, the most handsome man around, I bet he could make a good judgment on who is the fairest of these three. End of story. After all kinds of promises, Aphrodite becomes the winner. Hera had promised great control and power. Athena had promised Paris success in war and weaponry, but Aphrodite had promised him the most beautiful woman in the world as his wife. And so what we have here in the story of Aphrodite is really the beginning of the Trojan War. Paris chooses Aphrodite and gets his wife, pa uh, Helen of Troy, who unfortunately just happens to be married to somebody at this by this time. And that somebody, of course, is the um, is the hero um, Menelaus, the king Menelaus. So with a little bit of conniving from Aphrodite, she does fulfill her promise, and Paris and Helen elope. Then we have the story of Pygmalion. Pygmalion is an interesting character. Pygmalion was actually king in Cyprus. Remember, we've talked about that island way over there, towards the, going towards the uh, Near East, the Orient. Pygmalion. May, um, may well be perhaps one of the more familiar stories to you because there's a work by George Bernard Shaw which is called Pygmalion, and you may or may not be aware of it, but that's the play Pygmalion by G.B. Shaw which gives us my fair lady. There you got it, all the way back to Pygmalion. Pygmalion, king of Cyprus, um, is 
quite disgusted with the ladies at the time. He just has no interest in these ladies and he doesn't want to have anything to do with women whatsoever because they're rather, um, they're rather offensive. And so he's a bit of a, a sculptor himself. So he sculpts a statue of a female. And it is so perfect that he falls in love with his statue and treats it as if it were a human person. And then, of course, there is the major feast of Aphrodite over at Paphos. And Pygmalion goes there to the feast. And he prays to Aphrodite, oh, please, please make my statue come to life. And she obligingly gives life to the statue. And so we have the story of Pygmalion and his statue, which is not named in our earlier sources. This, by the way, comes from Ovid, his Metamorphoses. But we later call her Galatea. So there you have the story of Pygmalion and Galatea. His statue that comes to life. And they have a child, and the child's name is Paphos. P-A-P-H-O-S. Does that sound familiar? Well, of course. We've talked about it as being the place where Aphrodite has her major shrine on the island of Cyprus. And Paphos then later marries and has a son, Cinerus. I won't bother writing the name for you. And Cinerus has a daughter, Myra. Myra. And Myra falls in love with her father because there was a little problem. Myra, Myra's mother had boasted that the daughter, her daughter, Myra, was even more beautiful than Aphrodite herself. And of course, you don't get by in Greek mythology by boasting you are as good as the gods or the goddesses. In other words, it's the beginning of your downfall. And as punishment, Aphrodite did indeed cause Myra to fall in love with her father, Cinerus, and in disguise, through the connivance of, her, um, of the girl's nurse, she, um, she had sexual relations with her father, became pregnant by her father, and later gave birth to a young boy, Adonis, but not in a normal way because when her father discovered who this lovely young girl was with whom he had been associating every evening and discovered it was his daughter, he banished her immediately. She, in her flight from home, was changed into a tree, a myrrh tree. Notice the etiological um, foundation of her name. And when, the when she, the tree, so forth, was to give birth, it split open and we have the boy Adonis. Adonis is a lovely story. We hardly have a lot of time to get into that today, but Adonis is another story we could add over there to the stories of Aphrodite. He became a hunter, lovely young boy, very, very handsome. But he was a beloved of Aphrodite. She associated with him, and uh, she warned him to be very careful whenever he went hunting. But like a lot of young men, he just listened to so much of her story and um, went hunting anyway. And unfortunately, he was gored by a boar, killed by a boar. And Aphrodite, as you can imagine, was quite disconsolate when her poor little young love was killed. And so she asked the gods to allow her to have a memorial of him. So she poured nectar over the dying Adonis, over his blood, and up springs the flower called the anemone. Anemone. And you might say, well, what has anemone got to do with Adonis? Well, not exactly got a lot to do with him, but from his blood, as he dies, the anemone springs up. And this word, anemone, animos, is the Greek word for wind. And the anemone is a short-lived flower because the wind blows upon it and it doesn't last very long. A sense of the transient nature of life 
and indeed of human love. So we have another story there, a sort of a uh, etiological story telling us where the, um, the word, the flower, comes from. Now I said I would mention, maybe we can do that uh, here, that Aphrodite is the mother of Cupid. She is also the mother of a gentleman called Hermaphroditus. A uh, rather difficult name, no doubt. Let me write it up here. Hermaphroditus. And if you look closely at that name, you'll certainly recognize Aphrodite's own name in there. And a second look will tell you <coughs> that possibly the father of this child is Hermes. And you would be right to so guess. Uh, Mar Hermaphrodite is the uh, offspring of a union between Aphrodite and uh, Hermes. We've already spoken of Cupid as the offspring of, the, uh, of Aphrodite and Ares. So this is Hermes and Aphrodite. And um, Aphrodite's son, Hermaphroditus, was a very, very handsome young man. And a young nymph saw him. Her name was Salmacus, or Salmacus, whichever you prefer, Salmacus. And uh, one day he was out, um, he was out uh, swimming, and, sh and this young nymph saw him, fell in love with him, wanted to uh, embrace him. He would have nothing to do with her. She jumps into the river, grabs hold of him, and the two become one person. So that today we use the term hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite, to symbolize somebody who has dual gender characteristics, part female and part male. And that's the little story that comes from Hermaphrodite, a son of Aphrodite and um, Hermes. Then we have a rather nasty character called Priapus. And I'm not going to give you very much on him either. I call him the Scarecrow, basically. He is supposedly a son of Aphrodite. And, well, I suppose your guess is as good as mine. Some say maybe Dionysus, maybe Hermes, maybe somebody. We really don't know. But this is a rather crude character, an ithophallic character, a character that goes around and uh, uh, is a rather, he, he's rather um, promiscuous at best, and that's a fancy term for saying he's quite a lewd character, often associated with a jackass, an animal which unfortunately we don't think of in very elevated terms at times. So Priapus um, not used so much in major stories, but he does function in the scarecrow type, basically, as a garden god, a symbol of fertility, and a god who goes around with an erect phallus at all times, and basically is used in a lot of salacious stories. Interesting to see how such ugly characters can be tied into the goddess of beauty. Now, um, we have a few minutes where I can just mention one or two other sources, uh, literary sources, which might be of interest to you, and we'll sort of finish up with this general idea. Uh, other literary sources, I've mentioned, as you noted, uh, I've mentioned um, in the earlier part, the um, Theogony by Hesiod. I've referred to the um, Odyssey, uh, Odyssey 8 for the story of Ares and Aphrodite, of course, by Homer. And then we have, you have Mer Euripides Hippolytus. Hippolytus, that's the name of his play, one of his plays. And Hippolytus um, is a young man who's very much in love with beauty and Diana and chastity and will have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with, um, to do with um, Venus or Aphrodite. And so, as a punishment for his not taking Aphrodite and human love into account, in other words, trying to, be, to live free of love's power, he, um, he falls in, he, he's really killed, actually, at the end. He is cursed. 
He is somebody whose stepmother falls in love with him, and the stepmother sort of changes the subject. This is um, uh, Phaedra, the story of Phaedra, his stepmother, changes the subject and says, oh, but he attacked me, he tried to rape me, which of course was not the case. And there you have Phaedra telling the father of the boy, Theseus, that his boy is guilty of rape or attempted rape, and the father curses the boy, and the boy is killed. But before he dies, uh, Diana or Artemis, the, uh, the goddess to whom he is basically dedicated, um, sees that the father has the proper story, and therefore he is uh, sort of vindicated, but nonetheless he dies. What you actually have there in that story, which would take about a semester to go through really, is a struggle between uh, elevated pure love, if you want, or abstract love, or philosophical love, and sexual, human, normal family love. You have a, you have a conflict really played out on the natural level, but it really is between Artemis and Aphrodite. And of course, um, this struggle just tends to show that uh, we can't have excesses in either walk of life. Um, I want to try to get a second one in, if we have a moment. Uh, a second source, these are extra sources in addition to Hesiod and Homer, Euripides, and we have a work by a man called Lucretius. And Lucretius has a work that's called De Rerum, Natura, which translates into English as about on the nature of things, on the nature of the universe or the nature of the elements. So the man is Lucretius, oh, we don't quite know when he was born, let's just say around uh, 100 BCE, and he died about the middle of the century. By 55 BCE, he was certainly dead. And this work, I'm sort of guessing, is probably dated around, oh, Actually, it would be um, 59 BCE from internal evidence. We can sort of derive, derive that. Now, that work is usually um, ignored by most people when they talk about uh, Aphrodite. But I find it a very interesting part. In fact, a very, a very good place to, to wind up our lecture today. And I will read a little section from there, and I will assign you as homework a chance to read Plato's Symposium and find the wonderful section uh, that he has about the three genders, the male, the female, and the androgynous. The fact that originally the gods uh, had three sexes when the, female, when the human, uh, human beings were created, but the androgynous became a little, a little arrogant, a little too pushy, and the gods just split the androgynous in two, and so for the rest of our lives, we go around looking for the part that fits. In other words, the story of our love life, our search for a mate who really fits. But to finish up there, let me just read a little bit of the introduction, The Nature of the Universe, by Lucretius. He begins his first book by saying, Mother of Aeneas, and of course you now know we're saying Venus or Aphrodite, Mother of Aeneas and his race, delight of mortals and men, life-giving Venus, it is your doing that under the wheeling constellations of the sky, all nature teems with life both the sea that buoys up our ships and the earth that yields our food. Through you, all living creatures are conceived and come to look upon the sunlight. Before you, the winds flee, and at your coming, the clouds forsake the sky. For you, the inventive earth flings up sweet flowers, and for you, the oceans laugh, and the sky is calmed, and so forth. And on he goes to show that all life whether human or natural, is under the constant influence and control of Aphrodite, alias Venus, the mother and goddess of love and beauty.